few years, I've been fortunate enough to build up a double-digit property portfolio. And it's during this period that I've had to develop my knowledge and navigate through a whole host of challenges and mistakes. But the reality is, if I can do it, then so can you. This Property Market Investor Expert Series has been created so that you can learn from the mistakes which might otherwise be made along your investing journey and open up your knowledge to identify investing opportunities which you may have otherwise not even been aware of. Today, I'll be meeting with Chris Gray, who has built up an impressive property portfolio worth over $15 million. Chris took the painstaking decision to retire from his day job at the age of just 31 years old. And this was the direct result of the great results achieved through his investing strategy. So what is Chris's strategy? This is buying quality properties in the blue chip middle ring of Sydney. So let's find out from Chris more about his successful strategy. Hey Chris, how's it going? Yeah, very good, thanks. Um, so take us right back to the beginning. Sure. What motivated you to purchase that initial property? Right, okay. Well, look, I left school, um, actually came to Manly and was a backpacker here, had absolutely no money, I was about three or four grand in debt. Um, and I found Australia was an amazing place because I lived in a backpacker's, four to a room, uh, worked seven days a week, but you could go down and, and just see the beach and it's all for free. So I knew I wanted to come back to Australia. So I went back to the UK and my mum gave me, I, I said Saturday night, right, I'm going out with my friends, and she gave me a midnight curfew. So this is when you go back to the UK? When I went back to the UK after. Freedom after in Australia. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. she said, like, you've got to be back by midnight. And I said, mum, look, I've travelled all the way around the world. If I can get back from Australia, I can get back from the pub. <laughs> yeah. And she said, no, my rules, my house, midnight. So that was the catalyst for me to move out of home. Yeah. And so in hindsight, it was the best thing she could have ever done. Yeah, indeed. So I went around looking at uh, properties. I earned ten thousand pounds, and I had about a ten thousand pound deposit. Yeah. So I could borrow three times my income, so yeah. thirty grand. Yeah. Which in the UK was that was a, a shocking amount of money. Yeah. I'd have been mortgaged to the hilt, and I'd be in a really shitty unit in the worst place in town. Okay. And that's why none of my friends bought because yeah, you couldn't okay. afford it with London prices. So I didn't want to live in a shitty unit. So I went shopping for bachelor pads, <laughs> and I found this amazing one for about a hundred thousand pounds. And basically you get drunk in St Albans, which was about 20 miles north of London, yeah. fall down the hill and you basically end up on the doorstep. So it was the perfect, yeah, perfect yeah, bachelor wow. place. For sure. But I couldn't afford it. And so I worked the numbers out and what I basically worked out was even though I couldn't afford the interest repayments before, let alone after tax, if I could rent two rooms out, because this, this was a three bedroom house, I could actually live for free. So I went to my dad, not really for a handout, but to say, look dad, on this side, one bedroom unit can't afford it. This side, three bedroom house can afford the cash flow, yeah. but I just need to get the loan from the bank. <clears throat> and in those days they had parental guarantees, just like we have now. Yeah, and effectively he looked at the numbers and said, fine, I'll have it to back you. Oh, that's great. So and you had, sorry, you had yep. your own deposit. Yeah, so I had, had a deposit before. and it was more just borrowing seven or eight times your income. Yeah. Okay. And the way the UK market was, was that everything's in a chain. Yeah. And the guy that was selling this house wanted to move next door but the person that was going to buy his house before for a hundred thousand yeah. suddenly the person that was buying his and his and his didn't do it and so the whole chain falls over it's a stupid system I get it. so yeah, the yeah. agent came to me and said look you're a first home buyer there's no chain so you're really appealing yeah put in your best offer and i said i can't afford a hundred thousand i'm buying seven times my income anyway i can yeah. only afford 80 and they took it so i basically got a free house because the two tenants paid my rent yeah and i made two years salary overnight and that's what I thought was absolutely amazing. And what I worked out two years later was how to refinance, and I basically got a free Porsche as well. So I had a free house, free Porsche, and I lived for free, and I thought this is amazing, this stuff. <laughs> so you were now the ultimate bachelor. Yeah, exactly, because um, I couldn't afford a Porsche on a, like a three-year lease, Yeah. and then I saw an advert in a paper where they said you could use your home equity for home renovations or to buy a car. And this is back in the early 90s. It was unheard of to do this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so I went to the bank saying, hey, can I borrow three grand for a car? And they said, no, the minimum is 15,000. And I said, well, if you lend me 15,000, I'll take it. Went straight down to the Porsche dealer, bought a secondhand Porsche. And even though, again, people would say, oh yeah, but you've added 15 grand's worth of debt to your mortgage. Yeah. But by then my property was worth maybe 120,000. 
So even if I sold the property, paid off the house, paid off the car, I'd still made 25,000 profit. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And this is where I really got the early start. And this was at the age of 22, and then I bought the Porsche at 24. So I was super, super young, and there was no books, no magazines, so no one knew this stuff, it was teaching yourself. But suddenly it was just magic. Why work for a living when you can just make this easy money from property? For sure. And look, obviously it's not that easy and the market yeah, doesn't always yeah. rise, but that was my first touch on so property. it's kind of by coincidence then almost that yeah. you happened to time the cycle at that growth stage. Yeah, because the, the late 80s in the UK was when everyone was in negative equity. So they bought yeah. a house for 100, it dropped in value, so they had a mortgage for 100, yeah. but the property was 80, and we just got over that hump. So great timing. Yeah, it's like the recovery stage on yeah. its way up. Um, Okay, so that was your first and you decided to keep that property? Yeah, so I've still got that now. Yeah. And a year later I bought a second. So I started hanging out with a real estate agent that yeah. sold me the property. Uh, she was a young girl, very motivated. So we used to catch up for drinks once a month. Yeah. And then probably about a year later she said to me, um, we're, we're selling these uh, new properties that a developer's basically gone and renovated the properties, but we think he's undervalued them. And he wants 80,000 pounds for them but we think they're worth about 100. I said, well, let me in, come and show me before you put yeah, it on the market. Yeah. So I went to see the property, it was right by the station in the, the same town in St Albans, full of young people, yeah. and fell in love straight away, and I said, right, I'll take one, yeah. but you need to give me a few days. And so again, I went to my dad and I said, dad, look, I've made this, I've made 20 or 30,000 on this property overnight, yeah. why don't we team up as a father and son team and do some more investing? Yeah. Now." You've got the money and the, the backing and the income to get the, the mortgages, but you haven't got the time or, or the want to go off and do it. I've got all the time in the world. Um, I've got the contacts. I can deal with all the hassles and all the rubbish that you don't want to deal with. Yeah. And then we maybe split the profits 50-50. And he said, oh, good idea. And he, he didn't want money. He didn't need money. Yeah. He's not materialistic. But I think it was more he wanted to do something father and son type thing. Yeah. And you'd seen the success of the first property, presumably. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so he said, look, why don't you go and try and find a property? And I said, well, I've actually already found one. <laughs> well, we need to try and sign the contract tomorrow. Here's one ready. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's that kind of thing. <laughs> and so look, again, a lot of the skeptics out there will say, oh, look, you come from a rich background, you're very privileged, and you had your parents yeah. backing and the rest of it, which, which is true. But at the same time, say my brother and sister had exactly the same background, they didn't do the same thing yeah. because they didn't have the same goals and wants and needs and stuff like that. Yeah. So no matter what your background, you've got to have that, I guess, that want or the goal and you've got to be driven yeah. because it's still hard to go through, even if you've got parents helping you. True. And yeah. there's lots of people out there that have got nothing that have done it. Yeah. There's lots of people with stacks of cash that have done absolutely nothing. So. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your circumstances, if you really want to do this, you can. I agree. Yeah, so um, at that point, so you got two properties, both in London. Um, yeah. Did you then start to think, um, okay, I want to go back to Australia? Yeah, so basically I studied, so I worked full time uh, from like uh, nine to five, like most people, yeah. uh, doing accounting. And then I used to travel up to London and do night school four or five nights a week. So I wasn't coming home till maybe 10.30 at night. Yeah, yeah. So I was super driven to work and study at the same time, so I had money coming in. And then I had to study at the weekends as well. So for five or six years, it was hell. Like I was yeah, really, yeah. really working yeah. hard. But effectively, I worked twice as hard in my 20s, so I could then, from 30s onwards, I was, I've been pretty relaxed. So accounting got me my residency in Australia. So at 27, I gave up everything in the UK. Yeah. Literally put a backpack on and flew to Nairobi, probably one of the most dangerous cities in the world with about 10,000 pounds in cash, <laughs> yeah. because Africa had, didn't think it had any ATMs. Yeah. And I basically spent nine months traveling to Australia. So I went halfway through Africa, uh, then flew to Hong Kong, and then almost by land down to Australia, trip of a lifetime, yeah. and settled in Australia. And again, the thought process is, rent money's dead money, so I need to buy a house. And so I basically pulled equity out of the two UK properties, and I used that as a deposit to buy in uh, 99 in Coogee. Okay, and um, how, how long ago was this? So basically 99 to 20 years ago. 20 yeah. years ago, okay. And everyone was saying then, Chris, don't buy now. Every time the Olympics comes, yeah. it's always a massive increase and then it crashes afterwards. Yeah. And I, I was looking around for a three or four bedroom house. Yeah. Um, and with the prices, I ended up buying a two bedroom unit because that's all I could afford. Yeah. $360,000, everyone said, Chris, you're mad, you've paid way over the odds, it's gonna crash, don't do it. Like the normal skeptics that we're surrounded yeah. by today, that property's now 1.2, 1.3 million dollars or something. Was it a challenge 
coming to the country, um, I mean, you'd been here previously, but I suppose re-establishing yourself to get finance for that first that first No, so it wasn't too company. bad. So I basically worked for a dot-com yeah. over kind of um, uh, 99, 2000. And so I was an accountant by trade, so yeah. I probably earned 70 or $80,000. Yeah. Um, I had credit cards, I'd set up a bank account and stuff like that, so I had all yeah. that kind of history. So look, I think I came here in 97, I didn't buy till 99, so I probably had two years history. Yeah. So it was reasonably straightforward, and I was a resident straight away, so um, yes, yeah, that was pretty easy. Okay, um, and at this point, did you start to, I suppose, understand what property investing in and set yourself a goal at the end of it? Or was it always a short-term cash flow? No, so, so the UK property has always been cash, cash flow positive. Yeah. And I couldn't understand in Australia because all of my colleagues at work said it's cheaper to rent. Yeah. And I said, that doesn't make sense. And these are all accountants. Because if you go and tie yourself something to something for 30 years and it costs you, say, a thousand a week, why would you rent it out for 800? Yeah. Doesn't make yeah, sense. Yeah. Uh, but the more I investigated it, that was the thing, and that's this negative geared property which doesn't make any sense, and it's yeah. it's kind of against Robert Kiyosaki and all those kind of rules. Whereas the UK, yeah, you make a profit on the rent and you make the capital growth. Yeah. So that was a really hard thing to understand, but look, that's the way it was. And so really, the first six properties I bought, it was all self-taught. So even then, so even the late 90s, I hadn't seen Rich Dad Poor Dad. I think that yeah. was kind of fairly recent, but there wasn't the magazines, the newspapers, and people didn't know stuff. So I bought the Coogee one, then I refinanced later on, did it up a tiny bit, and then bought a, um, a fourth, then I bought a fifth and sixth. And it wasn't until then when the bank said, no, that's the end of it. And that was in the good old days of low doc loans and no yeah, doc loans, chicken yeah, so box, which was great. Loans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then they, they kept me out and yeah. that's when I started looking and I found education and I found seminars Yeah. and that's when the whole world opened because I was a narrow focus, accountant, job for life, Yeah. can't see anything beyond that path. Whereas I, I went to one seminar and it was one of the, um, trying to think, the Property Investors Club or something like that. It was yeah. very mumsy and dadsy, but the guy presenting, he knew everything. Every objection I had, he had an answer and I just thought this is incredible stuff. And so I just started learning. And um, was that more on, I suppose, how you set yourself up and to continue to get finance and then actually how you transition away from full-time work? Yeah, so a lot of it to start with was then using solicitors funds in those days yeah. to say if there's a will, there's a way you can always get finance. And it was just the mentality of an employee thinking, yeah, you've got to have a job and and this is all you can do. Yeah. Whereas this guy was just so wide like this, it was just amazing. And then I think they put me on to Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. And that was just a massive eye. Now, this guy had all the answers. Yeah. And I'd actually tried reading his book again about 10 years ago and I couldn't read it because it was so boring and so uh, so Robert basic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's because school. I've read probably 100 books since Too then or yeah, whatever indeed. else. But it was the thing that changed the world for yeah. most people for uh, for financial education. So did you kind of get stuck in that, um, not necessarily a cycle, but a positive environment whereby you are consistently educating yourself both in books, seminars, and yeah. did you also hang around a property related network? So, so I do now, yeah. So, so basically I got to the age of 31, I was working at Deloitte's um, in a recruitment area but around surrounded by accountants. And I interviewed about a thousand CFOs, so a thousand people that earned 250 grand plus. Yeah. And I thought they'd be all wealthy and lifestyle and the rest of it, but they weren't. They were tied to the job. They had wives spending money. They had houses in Mosman, yeah. big mortgages, kids at private school. So they're all poor, they effectively. Yeah. And that, that was the wake up. But then I did a course, and it cost me about 15 grand to do this course. And I couldn't afford it, and, and I, I signed a two-year lease, so it's like 650 a month. Yeah. And everyone at Deloitte said, you're mad, why would you pay 15 grand to go and do a course? And I said, well, Deloitte's aren't going to pay for that for me, so if I want to retire, if I want a better life, I've got to take responsibility, I've got to do it myself. Yeah. And they all thought I was stupid. But within a year, I basically retired at 31, and I bought a 3.5 Ferrari, uh, which was my dream car. And so the, the, one of the funniest days at Deloitte's was, I asked my boss about trying to, what's this thing about salary sacrificing cars? Yeah. And she said, I don't know, you've got to ring this partner. And so I rang this partner and I said, look, I'm, my name's Chris, you're not going to know me, I'm so low down in the firm, but I want to um, salary sacrifice this car, but it's worth around 500. He said, 500 what? And I said, $1,000. And it was just silence because <laughs> how can an employee be buying yeah. 
and I was buying a second hand one, so it was 250. Did you, um, sorry, was that through the finance or cash buy? So through finance, yeah. because my thought process was, is everyone says don't finance a car. Yeah. But if I pay 250 grand cash, I've got a depreciating asset. Yeah. Whereas if I put 250 grand into a million dollar property that rises by 50 or 100 grand a year, that more than pays for the car. Yeah, indeed. So I'm a fan of financing those things, but using the cash to then buy investments. Yeah. So anyway, he worked out that even though I was paying 250 for the car, that the FBT would be on the 500, the list price of the car. Yeah. So they worked out the tax was more than my wages. And they just couldn't understand how a junior employee earning 80 grand could be buying a 355 Ferrari. (laughs) And so when I then started parking it in the uh, the office car park and stuff like that, it's they all thought, no, it's, it's time to leave. It's it's yeah, uh, you're yeah. on a different wavelength. Indeed. I mean, were you negative for staff morale? You know, this guy. I know, I know. They're all pretty cool. Like, so I, I got <laughs> on, and, and even the MD. I think he was playing golf with one of the um, the client firms, and they said, "Oh, we hear all your staff drive Ferraris and yeah. things like that." Um, but no, it's really good. And I actually, started this got me into the education business because a lot yeah. of people said, "You're working about twenty hours a week." You're driving a fast car, you're working at Deloitte's, you don't really care about anything, you're having a good life, how can you afford it? And so I started teaching people. And because I didn't have anything to sell, like I had no business or anything, everyone believed what I said, because just like now, I'm telling a story. Yeah. And I'm just saying, whether you like it or not, this is what I've done, Mm. do whatever you want with the information. Um, And so that that kind of led me to become an educator. So I I literally did nothing for for maybe two or three years. And then, I started educating more and more people and then I ended up getting a TV show and then on to Sky News and this whole media career kind of started not from a basis of money or anything, it was just a personal interest in spreading the word and I love talking about me, I love talking about cars and trips and money because it's so different to what most people think, people have got an interest and people always love giving advice. So if I get people coming to me or doing things like this. I enjoy doing it, it's good fun. Yeah, indeed. So um, at this stage then, so you're driving a Ferrari, you're in your early 30s, um, had you refined the strategy that you now employ today? So looking at those blue chip Sydney middle ring suburbs. It's amazing. So I've done maybe 400 TV shows. Yeah. I've spoken to any expert I wanted to in the country, like the head of RP Data and Residex and people like that. And it's amazing the strategy hasn't really changed from when I was 22. Yeah. And my thought at 22 was is, if I rent a nice house or an apartment, and I rent it to wealthy young professionals that have got good jobs in like the Deloitte's or the banks or whatever, yeah. they're gonna pay the rent and they're gonna look after the property because they don't want their boss finding out that they've trashed a property or they've got a debt. And that stood me in the best, I guess the best possible strategy forever. Yeah. So in the UK I was investing in areas full of young people. There was kind of heritage areas, so they couldn't build any more properties. And when I moved to Australia, I was doing the Coogees, the Bondi's, the Tamaramas. Again, you've got three story height limits there. You can't physically build any more property because all the neighbors are butt up next to each other. So there's no more supply of property. There's loads of demand from young professionals that want to work in the city. They earn six figure salaries. They've got mummy and daddy to pay the deposits and the rest of it. And what I've learned from uh, Residex and RP Data is no matter what's going on in the economy around the world, the one economic thing that overrides every other rule is supply and demand. If there's none of something and lots of people want it, the prices are stable or they're rising. Yeah. And we're in a mixed market at the moment or the last couple of years. Yeah. The Coogees, the Manleys, the Bondi's, the Balmain's, two bedroom units with parking, small block, no lifts, gyms, pools. Sure, they might have dropped two or three percent, maybe even five yeah. percent. But they haven't done anything compared to the massive Zetlands where there's tens of thousands of apartments and it could be down thirty or forty percent. Yeah. So my strategy of going after the people with the money, but without paying five or ten million, staying around the median price, it's worked so well. Yeah. And I literally don't change strategy. I don't change suburbs, we, we bought in the same suburbs for the last 20 years. Yeah, okay. And um, as potentially somebody that's looking to make their first investment, would you suggest a similar strategy for them? Yeah, so a lot of people potentially can't afford those suburbs. Yeah. And look, that's fine, it's understandable. When you're young, you're not gonna be able to get in the best places. Yeah. Unless you've got parental help or something yeah. like that. So it's trying to get in the next best thing or yeah. as close. So I'd rather have, say, a one-bedroom unit in a really good suburb than have a two-bedroom unit that's 
say two suburbs away, for instance. Yeah. There's, there's pros and cons, but generally location is the thing that always works. Yeah, and so it's just about getting a foot in the, um, a foot in the door because you're not necessarily gonna live in this property and it's not the be all and end all if you're building a whole portfolio, it's just giving you a start. And sure, some people wanna go up to Queensland or they wanna go regional and they want a hot spot and try and find the latest, greatest area. But almost by definition, a first home buyer, they haven't got the knowledge for it. Yeah. Even I struggle, I don't hot spot. And I've got access to so many different people, I still don't wanna take the risk. And so, slow and steady wins the race is my, my motto. It's got it emblazoned across one of my cars. Yeah. And I just think is the more greedy you are, the more you're trying to make money overnight, doing the mining towns, all that kind of stuff. If it works, good on you, well done. But for most people, it generally doesn't. They get in at the wrong time, they get ripped off, they overpay, and they have problems with tenants. Okay, and um, speaking about timing, where, where do you think we are within the current cycle in Sydney? Is now suitable for somebody to potentially enter the market? So again, I'm contrarian with everything. I don't believe in cycles. Yeah. So I buy when I've got the money to buy, yep. when I can get a mortgage, and when I've got um, enough cash flow to hold on for the short term, i.e. the first few years. Yeah. And so I bought in booms, I bought in busts. So in shares, they call it dollar cost averaging. You just buy incrementally, always kind of buy. Yeah. Now property is a lot harder because it's half a million or a million dollars. But effectively the same thing is, is so I've got 14 properties that I've bought over the last, say 25, 30 years. Yeah. And I've just bought when I've got the cash. Some of my best bargains were in the GFC. And really they weren't bargains. They were just, I bought a better property for a reasonable price. Because, less good prop because there's less yeah, competition. Yeah, yeah, but you're never gonna get a half price in those suburbs. Yeah. But at least you're not gonna pay 10% extra. Yeah, okay. And so the good areas, they've always got competition. There's never any stock. Um, and so people, so quite often I say people want the perfect scenario. They want high capital growth. They want high rents. They want low interest rates. They want easy to borrow money from the bank and easy to buy property. And I've never in 30 years seen those five things happen. Yeah. And so at the moment you could say, well, okay, we've got low rents, um, which is a bad thing, but interest rates are low. There's maybe not much capital growth, but you might be able to buy now and you say, oh no, I'll wait for another couple of years. But by then you might not have your job or you might not be able to get a mortgage because the banking rules have changed. Yeah. So if everything's set, you can go, get in. That's my role. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And um, let's say, for example, you're talking with me. I am a first-time investor. I've yep. got the uh, the capital to get into, say, Manly. Yep. Uh, I've got enough to purchase a two-bed, one-bath apartment with a, a one-car garage. Cool. Um, but my objective is not to just stick with that one apartment for the foreseeable future. I want to sure. build out a portfolio. Yeah. Do, do you have strategies in place within these blue chip markets to kind of create equity that we can leverage and move from? Sure, look, so you can. So quite a lot of the properties I've renovated. Yeah. But in this kind of market, so in Sydney, I generally buy units because that's yeah. what the median price gets you for the area. Melbourne, I'll get, say, a villa or a townhouse. Anywhere else in Australia, I'll get a house because that's what the average person lives in. Yeah. When you're buying units, there's a limit to what you can do because you can't increase the yeah. square meterage and stuff. And they're sophisticated markets, so you're not going to be able to find that needle in the haystack, that unloved beauty that no one recognises because everyone recognises it in, this, in these suburbs. Yeah. And there's a limit that even if you're the best renovator in the world, there's a limit to what you can do to it. Yeah. So look, you can make a bit of money. So we might renovate for 70 or 80 grand and it might increase the value by 100, 120. Yeah. If you're super cool, you're doing it all yourself, you might be able to renovate for 50 grand. So you can make a bit of money there. Yeah. But it's not the be all and end all. And you might wait a year to find the perfect renovatable property, but if that market's moved by five or 10%, effectively you've lost the time value of money anyway. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. So look, we do it, but it's not a massive thing for us. Yeah. The main thing is, is I found is, the reason I've made a lot of money from property is I've just taken action and done it. Yeah. So if I go and buy today, yeah. versus someone else waits six or 12 months to kind of find their time, and then that suddenly changes to two or three years, no matter how well they buy, no matter how well they renovate, they're not gonna be able to beat someone buying today. Yeah, so, that, so that's part of yeah. it. But. Other people, if you are an active investor and it's not just a hobby thing, then sure, going further afield, maybe getting a house, maybe knock it down, do some townhouses or something like that. But like we said before, as, as a first home buyer, most of the time you haven't got the skills or the knowledge to do that stuff. Yeah. So sometimes as sexy as it sounds, it's cool, 
but sometimes slow and steady it just makes sense and so look I know lots of people that have done amazing things and they've made more money than me yeah but I'm an armchair investor I'm lazy I don't like taking risks even though I borrow large amounts of money yeah and I just want to buy it hold it and in my experience for 20 25 years it works do you think that in the, uh, I suppose, markets are always changing, um, banks are always changing, do, do you think that it's possible for somebody in the current environment to build up their own portfolio, maybe to the extent of which you've achieved? Anything's possible. It, it really is. And this is, this is the main thing that people need to learn. It's all about mindset. Yeah. So there's lots of gurus or property investors or high profile people that do lots of different things. Yeah. 90% of our mindsets are all exactly the same. Yeah. About paying interest only, not paying off debt, probably going variable interest, all these kind of things and yeah. what we see in the market. But everyone's got their own little niche. So they might go into positive cash flow or regional or blue chip or um, industrial or commercial or townhouses or uh, uh, what other kind of things, student accommodation, boarding houses there's no right answer it's pros and cons yeah so you've got to see what kind of person you are so i'm i'm naturally lazy i'm an armchair investor even though i'm at, uh, like active in, in terms of knowledge yeah so i want to set and forget i don't want to wear b and b my properties i want the same rent consistent yeah. year after year after year and i'm just going for more of a guarantee in a way and as long as i can hold on i think i'm definitely going to make money whereas other people they may live regionally and so they're going to have a better idea of what kind of people live there and what's happening in the local community. Whereas me, the western suburbs used to be Piermont. I've now found it can be Parramatta and even further. So I'm in a little bubble yeah. around the blue chip areas. Again, as if you're a handyman, if you're good with your hands, it's probably better you get into some renovating or developing type thing because you've got the skills, the knowledge, the contacts to go and do stuff. So learn the 90% and then just kind of create your own strategy for yourself yeah. based around your core skills, I guess what kind of money you've got, how the banks see you and things like that. And you can always diversify later on. So we've just built up a, um, a property syndicate probably about three or four months ago with, with um, some clients and we're investing in options now in kind of Western, uh, Western Sydney where we're putting, we might get a block of 25 or 50 units we might off, offer them an option fee to pay them double what their property's worth. We'll then spend a million dollars on a DA, go through council to get approval to build hundreds of units. Now it's a very, very high risk strategy, but the returns are massive and there's no debt. Yeah. So effectively we're just dealing in cash, we don't have any borrowings whatsoever. But this is a strategy for a lot of our clients that maybe we've already made a million dollars and this is a little punt for 50 grand. Yeah, I see. But we might double it, quadruple it, six times it, who knows but it's not a first home buyer strategy. It's for someone that can say goodbye to that 50 grand, whether they made a million or 950, who cares? But this is a toe in the water in a different field to see if it's gonna work for I them. Get, yeah, so maybe could this potentially be suitable for somebody who's already got a base portfolio? That's what you need, you need yeah. the base to start okay. with. I see. And, and so again, one of the things I learned at these courses years and years ago is, one thing was to spend 2% of your asset base re-educating yourself and getting better advisors yeah. so you either learn to protect your portfolio or you learn how to develop it and, and try different things yeah. and then you might have five or ten percent of that asset base that are in more speculative things so you might try a bit of developing or buying um, like some tech stocks or something like that yeah. or or some options or something like that but your core radio 90 percent is all safe, solid, streamlined type thing. Yeah, indeed. Um, so is this the next stage of your investment journey then, doing these larger deals? And, yeah. And what's the objective here? Is it to make lump sums of cash to potentially pay down your asset base and maybe get a lower LVR? Yeah, potentially. So my, so my assets are around 15 or 16 million. My debt's around 10 to 12, like yeah. a lot of it's in redraw. Okay. So I'm technically around 60 to 70% geared, yeah. but ideally I'm still geared to 80, so I've got my cash buffer. Yeah, I see, so you're liquid. And so look, the idea is, is really not to necessarily pay off debt, yeah. but if that 15 million doubles to 30 million, I only owe 10, then I'm only like 33% geared, yeah. which is positive cash flow and it's pretty much game over. Yeah. So it's really the next few years that I should make, make my, um, I guess, real money and, and, and really solidify security. Yeah. And whether I've got 50 million, 30 million, 20 million, I don't care. 
like as long as you've got a certain amount of money, it doesn't matter. But yeah, doing this option thing is more lump sum extra bonuses. Yeah. And look, whether I for personal. Uh, probably not. So to start with, my main thing is to have a big cash buffer. I want yeah. kind of 10 years cash buffer uh, to make sure that if we go through another downturn, which will happen at some point, yeah. or if we get high interest rates, I can get through it. That's yeah. the main thing. Okay. Um, so rather than pay down the debt, it will probably be more put money into offset or into redraw so that I've still got the facility to pull it back out. Yeah, okay. Has the portfolio ever been cash flow positive? It almost got there a couple of years ago yeah. um, because our rents were pretty high then the, a lot of the mortgage rates really came down. Yeah. But then over the last couple of years, it's then gone a nightmare that the banks, especially for people like me that have got multiple loans yeah. and some of them second tier lenders or third tier lenders, and they jacked them up. So I was paying like 5.7% until we've had the recent rate drops. Yeah. Most other people were paying fours. So I'm paying like one and a half, two percent extra. And so look, as much as it's depressing and I don't want to pay 5.7% interest, if I'm still making money, who cares? Yeah, that's And right. that's the thing. So ideally, I think I make, say, 5 to 10% growth. So I'm making 750 to one and a half million a year yeah. over the long term. So whether it costs me nothing or two or 300 grand, as long as I can cash flow it, it doesn't really matter yeah. because the net is then 500 or a million dollars or something. That's right. And do you think that you're going to be able to resist the temptation of buying more properties? You get to a cash flow position. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I've tried. So I haven't bought property for a long time. Yeah. And this is the whole thing is, I guess part of my success is I've always over-invested. So where people have got cash in the bank, I can't sleep. Yeah. Because I think it's underutilized, yeah, it's a waste. So I actually overly borrow, buy too much property, then I've got no cash, yeah. and then I think, oh shit, like what am I gonna do? I'm gonna run out of cash flow, so then it, it, I, I start working. Yeah. And so it's actually quite a good motivator. It's, it's almost like for saving. Definitely. And that's what people yeah. love with a house, it's for saving. And that motivates me, because otherwise I'll be playing with my cars, sitting on the boat, doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. So it gets me off my backside to actually do some work. So look, I'm gonna try not to buy any more property. Because like I said, whether I've got 15 million or 20 million, your life doesn't change. Yeah. You don't have better houses, better cars after you've got to a certain level. And so it's really, that's pure risk. So the people that are pushing it to the limits like developers do, you put it all on the line. I've got a family or kids now, I don't want to put it all on the line. I don't want the stress. I've already lost all my hair from stress from uh, too many mortgages and things like that. So yeah, I want a pretty relaxed life. So I don't need to push the boundaries. I've got nothing to prove to anyone. Um, people think what they do, and the reason I put my the my numbers in in magazines and papers and stuff like this is, I've got nothing to hide. I've got 15 million. Whether people think that's a lot or not a lot, or you should be more successful, I don't care. That's what I've got. Yeah. And so people can't accuse me of big noting myself or underquoting things. That's the number. Go and ask Deloitte if you want. It's in all the papers. So I've got nothing to. I am what I am. So Fair I don't enough. worry too yeah. much. Now, if people want to learn more about your strategy and potentially speak with yourself, what should they do? Sure. Well, the, the great thing is, is I put all the strategy that I've used into a book called The Effortless Empire, and I wrote it back in 2008. I've read it, by the way. Good right, book. okay. Good yeah. stuff. Well, literally nothing has changed. So we, we produced, I don't know, 60, 70,000 copies, yeah. and nothing's changed in the book. With all that learning, with the GFC, all of this stuff, the only thing we changed was in 2008, the average price of property was 500 grand. Yeah. I rewrote it in 2015. The only thing I changed was the examples were then a million dollars, i.e. the doubling in that seven yeah, years. Indeed. And so um, people can get it for free if they just go to yourempire.com.au or just Google Chris Gray. They can download it as a PDF or um, an audio book. And if they're very rich and they've got $4.95, they can pay for a stamp and we'll even uh, mail them a hard copy as well. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks so much for your time today. Pleasure, thanks, thanks for having me. Okay. Good to see you.